as Darwin put it about himself, <clears throat> I was born a naturalist. With six, at the age of six already, I was a passionate uh, bird watcher. My older brother had an aquarium, which we jointly take care of, took care of, and we caught little fish in the little sticklebacks in the streams and ponds of the neighborhood, and snails and things, and watched all the water life, the water, the larvae of insects living in the water. And my mother was a great collector of mushrooms. She knew not only the poisonous and the edible ones, but she knew everything about the in-between kinds of mushrooms, which is the majority. She really knew mushrooms well. And both of my parents took us three boys every weekend <coughs> to on a little excursion, on a hike, on a walk, and we studied the spring flowers, or my father took us to a limestone quarry where we uh, found ammonites and other fossils, or we went to a heron colony and watched that. Anyhow, I was almost trained to be a naturalist, and the most important thing is uh, my father had a wonderful library, and we always bought books galore, and I devoured all the books of explorers that went to various places in the world, and I admired what Humboldt had done, and Bates, and Darwin, and the Swedish explorer Sven Hedin, and others. And I was dreaming all the time about someday being an explorer, going to the tropics, going to the jungles, seeing new things, discovering strange animals, and so forth. But of course, it was a dream world. In the meantime, I went dutifully to the gymnasium, the German uh, equivalent of the high school, and I prepared myself for a medical career because my family was definitely a medical family. My father's brother was a medical, medical man. There were three generations of, medical, of doctors prior to my father's generation and I was to be the doctor of my generation, and I didn't mind that at all. I rather liked the idea, and when my father died of cancer, uh, it was confirmed, so to speak, my desire to be a doctor, because I said, <clears throat> surely something could have been done to save his life, as one is, uh, in, as a young person, uh, full of such ideas. And I finished my high school, and I... Uh, started medical school, and right at that period, something very unexpected happened. On one of my excursions, birdwatching excursions, and excursions, and I went out to the field almost every day after I had finished the gymnasium, I saw a, on a pond, I saw a duck with a red bill, and I said, well, <laughs> that must be, I never heard of a duck with a red bill. That, uh, what can this possibly be? And I dashed back on my bicycle to the town of Dresden, where we were living at the time, and tried to find somebody to confirm it, because I said, well, if somebody else doesn't see it, nobody will ever believe that I saw such a thing. And of course, I couldn't find anybody. And finally, eventually, at the a meeting of the Dresden Ornithological Society, I met a pediatrician who said to me, he said, well, I don't know whether you saw this or not, but why don't you tell it to Germany's leading ornithologist, Professor Stresemann in Berlin? And I said, well, how should I ever get in touch with him? And he said, well, that's easy. He and I are very good friends. We studied together. I write you a letter of introduction. And when you go to your university town, you have to go through Berlin anyhow to change trains. Why don't you stop for a while and see him and so forth? And so I did. And I went to the museum and I met Professor Stresemann, who greatly impressed me, even though I now have reconstructed it. He was only 34 years old at the time. And he uh, demanded that he could see my daily notebooks of my bird observations, which I 
kept very carefully and made all sorts of sketches and everything else. And then he asked me questions about birds, one after the other, then he showed me specimens, and that was the hardest part because the specimens in the trays in the museum <laughs> didn't look at all like the birds in the field. But anyhow, when it was all finished, he said, well, yes, I believe you, and I'm going to publish your observation. And he told me, he said, what you saw was a red-crested poacher. That's a Mediterranean duck, which every once in a long while, one of them strays across the Alps to Central Europe. The last one that did so before your observation, this was 1923. The last one before that was in 1846. So it really was a, a strange thing. And so he published it, and a little friendship developed between myself and Stresemann, who was much taken by my incredible enthusiasm. Stresemann took to me, and he said, and he saw my enthusiasm, and he said, would you be interested in your college vacations to come here to, to the museum as a volunteer? And I thought somebody had given me a key to paradise. <laughs> I said, of course I would, and I did. And he put me to work unpacking uh, new collections that came from expeditions in various places of the world, and I was permitted to identify specimens that hadn't been yet identified and so forth. And I had a wonderful time, and I had opportunity to talk with Stresemann about all sorts of things. And one day he said to me, after I talked about my dreams about the topics and expeditions and the jungles and all that, he said to me very seriously, he said, now, look here, young man, if you become a medical doctor, you will never have a chance to go to the topics. You will be far too busy. And then when he saw how my face fell, he said, well, but there's an alternative. Let me make a proposal. Suppose you, after you finished your first half of the medical study in Germany, the preclinical period and the clinical are sharply separated. After you finished your preclinical period, why don't you stop studying medicine, take a degree in zoology, a PhD, and when you have that, then I can find a place for you in an expedition somewhere, I'm quite sure. As soon as I had my candidate of medicine degree, I stopped medicine and I went into zoology and I did something that is um, almost unbelievable. In 16 months, I, took study, I, did, I, I fulfilled all the requirements of a PhD candidate in zoology, including a semester of philosophy and a great deal of botany and so forth. And I had written my thesis in that time. It was ready for the examination. And on the 24th of June, my oral examinations were all completed and I was awarded a degree of uh, a PhD in zoology. I was mentioning that uh, Stresemann had said that maybe if I switched to zoology and got my PhD, he might be able to get me onto an expedition. Well, he was quite serious about that, and he tried very hard. There was an expedition going to Cameroon in Africa, and that didn't work out. Another one was to Peru uh, in connection with some American oil explorations, and that didn't work out. But finally, he, Stresemann, persuaded Lord Rothschild in England, the famous uh, owner of the largest private bed collection, that he should have a collector in New Guinea. Actually, Rothschild had had a collector there, but he had a stroke and had to give up working. And so there was a vacancy, again, one of these chance things in my life, and Rothschild, not knowing anything about this fellow Ernst Meyer, but being persuaded by Stresemann, in whom he greatly believed, said, all right, I'll send him out, and I have a very definite task for him. Uh, there are some so-called rare birds of paradise. In the days when ladies 
put birds of paradise and other feathers on their hats. Every year, the natives all over uh, New Guinea skinned out birds of paradise and sold them to dealers. And the two major dealers were in Rotterdam and Paris. And uh, then the uh, people make a dawn hat uh, bought from these dealers. And once in a while, among all the well-known birds of paradise, turned up a unique specimen, something that nobody had seen before. And where these species occurred was a great puzzle, and expeditions went out to all sorts of places and never found these rare ones. There were three mountain ranges that hadn't been in Dutch New Guinea, that hadn't been properly explored. So my task given to me by Lord Rothschild was to go to those three mountain ranges and collect them thoroughly and see whether I could find one or the other of those rare birds of paradise. Well, to make a long story short, I had no experience, of course. I'd never shot a bird, I'd never skinned a bird. Stresemann was very, how shall I say, optimistic about the whole thing. But I got a rush job training in some of these things, and then and I worked at the uh, I went over to England and talked over with Rothschild and his curator about uh, further matters of collecting. And then I, the most fortunate thing was that I stopped in Java at the Dutch Colonial Museum and they had some very experienced native Javanese assistants who, could, who had been on expeditions and were even good at bird skinning. And they agreed to lend me three of those to accompany me to New Guinea. And in due time, I got to New Guinea and established camps in various altitudes and in various villages and, and things, and collected and collected and collected. And in due time, I had learned from these three Javanese uh, whatever there is to be known about life in the jungle and in the mountains and how to make a camp and how to deal with the natives. And I built up very beautiful collections. After I'd been up in the mountains, that uh, after I was there about three or four weeks, suddenly a troop of, I think it was five, of the native police of Indonesia appeared in my camp and they had a letter which said that the governor of New Guinea and the Moluccas, that was one person, uh, couldn't allow that a person of such distinction as I, because I had <laughs> letters from the German government, uh, to be unprotected. And these five police soldiers should protect me against these dreadful natives. And, of course, I had gotten on fine with the natives. There was, I couldn't see any danger at all, but these soldiers, every evening, they uh, became guardians of the entrances to my little camp and so that nobody could enter it and do something to me. And pretty soon they saw all sorts of things happening there. They were terribly scared of the natives. And... Uh, Pretty soon shooting started. Oh, we saw something and we had to shoot at it and so. And uh, I was I was really, I was annoyed and I was also a little bit uh, concerned because I, I thought maybe, this, maybe there's something to all this. And then one night they woke me up after another shooting spell and said, uh, uh, we just shot somebody. And I said, oh my God, that's the end of my <laughs> expedition here. And I said, where is he? So they took me across a little brook that was alongside my camp. And I looked around with a kerosene lamp and I couldn't see anything. There wasn't anybody there. I uh, sent these fellows to the coast explaining the whole thing. And I went inland to a higher village and started a new uh, collecting period. And after about two weeks, 
Suddenly, somebody rushed into my little hut and said, oh, there, was, there's, there are a lot of people coming, a lot of soldiers coming. And I said, no, what? And I went outside and I could see the ridge that came up from the coast and the pass was right at the very top of the ridge. And there was a column of about, I think it was 105 people, something like that. And there were two white men in uniforms of, of officers of the uh, colonial police force and about 20 soldiers, and the rest were porters carrying all their stuff and food and so forth. And I still didn't know what it was all about, but I decided to go down into the valley separating my ridge from this coastal ridge, and I, there was a river flowing there, and I went down there, and the leading officer of the other group uh, waded into the river toward me, and the first thing he said, Oh, I'm so glad you're still alive. <laughs> I said, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. Oh, he said, these soldiers that you sent back to the coast reported that the natives had uh, um, uh, attacked your camp and had massac massacred you and all your people there. And, and we, police soldiers, by shooting all of our ammunitions had been able to escape and get down to the coast. They had made up that story because they were embarrassed appearing on the coast when they were supposed to protect me and the others suddenly appeared having abandoned me. Well, they had a court-martial later on and so on and so forth. Long story, but anyhow, I was also told I had to now immediately return back to the coast. It was just too dangerous. But I knew that there was a lake even further in and even higher up that I'm sure was very interesting and so I totally disobeyed the order from the Dutch government and I went up to that lake and sure enough discovered a new finch up there and, and uh, several rare birds that I never encountered anywhere else in New Guinea. So I had a really marvelous time. So that's just one little story about then there were two other mountain ranges where I had similar experiences and, and so forth. And at the end of that period, I had, in about seven months, collected uh, over 3,000 birds. And the main reason for my great success was that I knew how to make use of the natives. And there is a story that is absolutely true, and it surprises just about everybody, I tell it. After I'd been a little while in this first collecting place, I realized that every bird the natives saw and that they had shot, uh, they knew the name. So I recorded the Latin name that I knew and the name the natives gave me. And since they knew birds so well, I had three little bird guns. I gave it to the natives and I told them always when they came with a particularly rare bird, let's say Nieda. I said, well, I want more Nieda. And then they went out and they brought back Nieda, and not the common stuff, you know. And at the end, when I finally summarized everything, I found that I had, in this locality, collected 137 species of birds, and the natives had given me the names of 136 of these, there were only two little indescript, uh, nondescript looking little warblers, green warblers, which uh, they had given the same name to the two different species. And I'm sure if I had gotten the right kind of an old man, he would have been able to have <laughs> the name of that 137 species. The biological species is an, is an absolutely obvious entity to any good naturalist, and so they had. And they were very, very clever. They had a, I'm now using the language, the pidgin English language of Eastern New Guinea. They would have the male bird of paradise with this particular thing. And then uh, there came a female and I said, what's that? And they would say, oh, that's Mama Belong. And then the name of the male. They knew perfectly well that there were not two different species, which 
why the a purely typological species concept might have been the case. No, they, they, the, the knowledge of birds, they knew exactly which bird had only one egg in the nest, which species had two eggs in the nest and all that. They were superb woodsmen and very often in certain localities in New Guinea and in the Solomon Islands, I would distribute all the guns to the natives and I would go out and collect uh, orchids and other things that the natives weren't interested in collecting. I had a very, on the whole, a very happy childhood. To begin with, <clears throat> I would say it looked as wonderful as it could be. After all, I was born in Germany in 1904. At that time, Germany was very prosperous. The world as a whole was peaceful, very prosperous. Uh, my father had a brilliant career. He was uh, promoted to a justice of the Supreme Court of Bavaria at the very young age of 47. My mother came from a banking family and was very affluent. I had two brothers whom, with whom I got along very well and everybody in the family was healthy, so nothing could have been more wonderful. And then, of course, in 1914, the great catastrophe began, the First World War, in which several of my cousins were killed and other friends, and uh, eventually things got from bad to worse, then came that post-1918 famine, where well, we really starved. We didn't have enough to eat. And then came the 1923 inflation in which the whole family fortune was wiped out. But in spite of all these misfortunes, and they were really very tragic misfortunes, uh, we had owing to the... And then in 1917, my father died at the young age of 49 from cancer and my mother had to raise us three boys all by herself. And in spite of all these misfortunes and difficulties, the childhood was still a rather happy one because my mother was an absolutely marvelous person who coped with all these difficulties. And I had hobbies and things that I was interested in. My dissertation was a biogeographical one, and it was in a way connected with that duck that appeared in Central Europe after 80 years, but this dealt with a small finch-like bird, relative of the canary, also a Mediterranean species, which in the years between about, let's say, 1770 and the present time, had spread from the Mediterranean on both sides of the, uh, of the Alps into, your, into Central Europe. And the argument was among the ornithologists, maybe it had been there all along and just had been overlooked before. And so my thesis was to trace that movement through all the natural history literature of all the little local societies and whatnot and then try to explain it in ecological terms. The observers are, are the, the really important thing. You see, there are bird watchers everywhere and always have been, right back to the year 1800 and earlier, and they would record what they have seen, just like the vicar of uh, Selborne, uh, who recorded every day what he saw, and these natural history. But I had to get the most obscure natural history journals, for instance, for of provincial societies in France, and I had to do a great deal of library work, work and also constantly interpret what I read because sometimes people would record that bird and it really wasn't true. And you had to sort of know who was reliable and who wasn't. Well, anyhow, I got together a very convincing story and mapped the spread of the bird in 25 year periods and developed a number of ecological theories about spreading. And I'm still, I just read within the last year or so, somebody giving me credit of having been the first to have developed this or that. 
biogeographical ecological theory. Anyhow, I got, and it was printed the next year in the German big ornithological journal. I was quite interested in bird migration because in connection with the spreading of the of the seven finch, which was the bird that I worked on, I was interested how when a bird spreads northward into new territory, what happens in the winter? Does it stay there now or does it go back to its uh, home territory? And these connections between the breeding place in an unsuitable climatic region and the winter quarters, how this developed and whether the winter quarter is always the same, whether there is any competition between the uh, wintering temperate zone birds in the tropics, and all that, all those questions I was very much interested in, and it's quite interesting. I was sent just two weeks ago a manuscript by a young man who, not knowing that I had ever worked on this sort of thing, had taken up exactly all these same questions and had developed theories about it. So uh, the, perhaps what was most important was that I showed in how many places uh, wintering birds occur in the same places where other populations of that very same species uh, nest and breed and raise young and there is no uh, interbreeding ever between the wintering birds and the local residents because their hormonal state is totally different and so they just don't even recognize each other as being the same species and so on and so forth. I've developed a theory that spreading birds, for instance, uh, always pick a few optimal spots to settle down first, the first uh, colonists, and then these became centers of uh, spreading and they expanded out from these favored, from these optimal places into less suitable places until finally the whole range, the whole region was filled with breeding pairs. I was very much interested in biogeography and cleaning out some of my drawers in the museum the other day, I found a lot of notes that I had written in those days, in the 1920s, uh, material for a book on biogeography, which I was planning to write, and which I never wrote. And uh, yes, biogeography was, was perhaps my foremost interest at that time in connection as a result of my PhD thesis. And I was quite annoyed uh, about a book that was published at that time by Hesse, which was very popular, was translated into English, and called itself Ecological Biogeography. And when I studied it, I said, no, this is not a book on ecological geography. This is a book on geographical ecology. Uh, <laughs> there are two very different things, but we still do not have yet a good book on ecological geography. And a book that I now have in press together with, as with co-author of Jared Diamond, dealing with the birds of the islands northeast of New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and the Bismarck Archipelago, which usually are combined as northern Melanesia. Uh, we have this book in press right now, and that deals a great deal with the ecology of biogeography. Why are certain species spreading and others not? Which ones disperse most easily? And which uh, can uh, endure competition, which others cannot endure competition, and so on and so forth. It's a great deal of ecology related to biogeography. And that is, so I've, I've sort of come full circle from my early PhD interests until one of the very last things that I will be writing in my life. I am at the present time, and even more so, let's say, 20 years ago, uh, rather aggressively assertive. And that is due to the fact that in many ways, all through my early life, I was 
sort of a neglected entity. Now, to begin with, I was the middle one of three brothers. And in my family, unknowingly, the family always had some preferential things for the oldest one and some preferential treatment for the youngest one, but there was no special preferential treatment in any respect for the middle one. And I resented it. And then I, I moved around in school a good deal. I first was in Bavaria and Munich, and then we moved to Dresden, where they speak a totally different dialect, and I was placed in the seating order as the last one, gradually integrated into the class, and I was always sort of, uh, uh, I had to fight for, for, for my existence, so to speak. Then in university, I realized that uh, biologists, zoologists in my case, really were not considered as highly as the physicists and mathematicians. And again, I had to assert myself. And, and so again, and then of course, when I came to America in 1931, I was a German, and Germany at that time was not in very high regard, and 1933 Hitler came to power, and it got even worse, and again I was sort of uh, uh, silently, unknowingly perhaps, uh, discriminated against. And then of course I was a museum person, and the, the minute I was branching out into fields like evolution of biology, history of biology, philosophy of biology. At the beginning, I was a museum man, and they didn't have a very high reputation. I wasn't a professor, I wasn't teaching anywhere. And again and again, when it came to awarding honors in those days, now I get more honors than I, <laughs> I need. But I didn't get the honors because I was only a museum person, you see. So, uh, and, and, and the result was that I sort of tended to very aggressively defend my views and all that, because if I didn't, I would have been ignored. When I was uh, about 30, I had suddenly developed bleeding from my... I had blood in my urine, let's put it that way. And no special pains or anything, but at every three, four months, I had another spell of bleeding. And I finally, uh, being very unsuccessful with ordinary doctors, I went up to the uh, urogenital clinic at PNS, Physician and Surgeon Medical School of Columbia University in New York, up on 100th Broadway and 168th Street. And I went up to the floor I which said you were general. I didn't know anybody. And uh, the receptionist said, uh, whom do you want to see? And I said, I want to see some specialist of urinary problems. And so she got an intern, fellow by the name of Rathbone, who got me in his office. And he said, now, young man, what's, what's your problem? And I said, I think I have a tumor in my left kidney. And he immediately laughed. He said, now, young man, a tumor in the kidney is a thing very difficult to diagnose. Whatever got you to have that diagnosis? And I said, well, I said, the blood in my urine is rather black. And so I decided it wasn't something in the bladder, but up in the kidney. And the second thing is, I don't have any special pains. Uh, any really acute pains, so it isn't a kidney stone. And then I said, uh, oh, and I said, my, and my left kidney, yes. And I said, I sometimes there's sort of a heavy feeling on the left side, so I decided it is on the, in my left kidney. And then my father died of sarcoma of the kidney, and so to guess that it might be a tumor, uh, was the obvious one for me. And that's how I came to my diagnosis. And he said, well, he said, uh, we have to make all the tests and the 
cystoscope me and they x-rayed me and they finally found something that looked by God, it looked like a little uh, papilloma in the pelvis of the left kidney. And they said, well, we have to watch this and uh, come back in half a year and we take another x-ray and if it has grown in the meantime, then we'll have to operate it. Well, uh, it had grown, it, uh, my left kidney was taken out and when I was lying there about three or four days after the operation, the uh, physician in charge of the floor came by with his students every day for the clinical analysis. And he said, when he came to my bed, he said, now here we have a very unusual case. Here is a patient who came to us with a ready-made diagnosis and for once he was right. That is a difficult question to answer because I've worked in so many fields. I've worked in five different fields. Now, which are the most important? Now, in some way, the development of the biological species concept, which I did not invent, but certainly was the person that brought it to general knowledge, and the whole field of new systematics, which I really am the one who developed it, was one of my major contributions. And the other one, which is still not yet realized by almost anybody, is that I have done more, I believe, for the development of a philosophy of biology than any other person. Others have written books on philosophy of biology, but all within the framework of the standard philosophy of science, which is based on physics, logic, and mathematics. While I have been trying to show that there are a certain number of basic concepts in biology, like the genetic program or the bio population and a few others that make biology just simply totally different from the physical sciences and therefore also requiring an entirely different philosophy. <clears throat> I think it was a professional thing. All the people that went into philosophy of science turned out to be, turned out to have come from logic, from mathematics and from the physical sciences. And the few people in the earlier periods, and I'm speaking now of the whole 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, all the people that did philosophy of biology uh, were affected by the bug of vitalism. In other words, they believed that the difference between physics and biology was that physics was a pure science and biology required that extra thing which nobody understood what it was, this vis viva, this Lebensgraf, this sort of thing, which this elan, um, what did he call it? El Vital. Uh, yes. Uh, and that had to be first ref to be refuted. And that complete refuti refutation of vitalism didn't happen until about the 1920s, 30s. Only then you could develop a complete philosophy of biology that was based on biology, that was based on living organisms, but explained everything at the cellular, molecular le level exactly all in terms of physics and chemistry, not uh, invoking any vital forces or something like that. At the beginning, my early career, my development of the so-called new systematics was the thing I was very proud of. And at the species level, uh, everybody followed my, and Nelson, for instance, made this clear in his uh, statements yesterday. But then, I'm so used to that now, the latest thing I'm 
most proud of is, and that has not yet been f fully appreciated by the philosophers, is my development of uh, the philosophy of biology. Now, I am the first one who clearly has said that there are aspects of biology that have nothing to do with vitalism, that are so different from anything in the physical sciences that biology simply requires a separate uh, philosophy. For instance, uh, biopopulation, the whole concept of biopopulation, is something that is alien to anybody in the physical sciences, and yet it is one of the basic philosophical concepts of biology. The idea that uh, <clears throat> in the physical sciences anything that happens has only one causation, and that's the natural laws. In biology, everything and anything that happens has two sets of causations, the natural laws and the genetic programs. That's just two of these really fundamental differences between biology and the physical sciences. And I'm the first person that has really made this clear and has pointed this out. Another thing, for instance, is that theories in the physical sciences are always based on natural laws. Theor in, in natural laws, the like uh, they have in the physical science, we don't have in biology, no specific ones. We have regularities that are sometimes referred to as laws, but they're, they're not the same as the natural laws of the, of the physical sciences. Theories in biology are invariably based on concepts, whether it's the concept of natural selection or resources or whatever you name selection. It's a, it's a concept that is the basis of, of, of any biological theory. I remember that I was in Naples at the time, and incidentally I went to Pompeii with Jim Watson on, on the day before, and I had uh, arguments on evolution with a Belgian evolutionist with the name of Hertz, H-E-U-T-S. And uh, we argued and argued and we couldn't get together at all. And I went back to the hotel and I suddenly had an insight. I said, well, I said, if we have a very small population, a founder population, with a very much impoverished gene content, then a genetic reconstruction, a genetic reordering is so much faster and easier than in a large population, in a large widespread population. And that rapid turnover in a marginal peripheral little population is the secret of why uh, suddenly evolutionary changes occur that will not be reflected in the fossil record because the chance that one of these little founder populations that rapidly changes will be discovered by geologists is nil. And so I got this idea of the importance of the small, of the evolutionary importance of the small population for a rapid, for a great speed up in evolutionary rate. And that idea I, I then came back to lectured on it in Oxford the same year and finally published a paper in 1954 uh, in which I in detail developed the thing. And this paper was later used by Eldridge and Gould to um, they named this process that I had described, dis discovered and described. Punk traded yeah. equilibria, you see. But it is really nothing. In fact, I even uh, set in my 1954 paper, and again I repeated it in my 1963 book, I said that this is what explains in part why there are so many gaps in the fossil record, because those kind of population would never be discovered by geological work. This is almost like a joke, but 
when I was at the American Museum in New York, a lot of young people came and saw me. Practically, every, I was well known as the one young people, particularly bird watchers, could talk to. And it was well known that I had a great deal of experience in anything having to do with birds. Well, how they ever came to, to it, but I don't know. But one day, Jim Watson's parents appeared in my office. Uh, they had some other thing to do in New York, no doubt, because they lived in Chicago. And they knew I was an ornithologist, and I think Jim knew about me and had already acquired a certain admiration for my work. And so Mrs. Watson asked me, uh, that she said, Jim wants to become an ornithologist. Where should he go for his studies of ornithology? At that time, of course, everybody went to Cornell. And I said, probably to their surprise, I said, he shouldn't study ornithology at all. He should, in his undergraduate career, get a very good basic training in biology. And when, after four years, he was still keen on ornithology, then I would be willing to suggest where he should go for graduate school in ornithology. And so the result was, maybe other people said the same thing. I don't credit myself as being the only one who guided his future. Anyhow, he did follow just that. He went to a good school, I think it was, University of Chicago, got an excellent training in biology. And of course, in the course of that, he encountered all sorts of interest, all sorts of problems that were far more interesting than bird watching. And so he never followed up his intention to become an ornithologist, but it became the discovery of the double helix, all through to my giving him good advice. <laughs>
and then I work out what is the real right answer. And, and this happens to me very often, and of course some of these answers that I find are already in the literature, but sometimes I am the first one who makes that discovery. And I think this uh, attention to wrong statements and endeavor to correct them is part of the answer. And I always think about things, and when something puzzles me, well, that's of course was, was one of Darwin's secrets. Whenever something puzzled him, he tried to find a, a theory. He, find, he made a conjecture, as Papa would call it, and see if it worked out. And that's true even today. And, and it is even true, I go walking with a friend every day. And constantly he's amazed at me. I see something and I begin to ask questions. Now, why are there these big rocks here? There shouldn't be any big rocks here, you know, things like that. Uh, I like to ask questions. I think that is part of the secret of, of, of my success, that I ask questions and occasionally I find a very good answer. Well, uh, everybody looking back over what we have said finds that certain things were, one believed, turned out to be wrong. Now, for instance, uh, there was a time when E.B. Ford recognized different kinds of polymorphism, one of them neutral polymorphism. And he said, he said that uh, uh, that was one of the categories, and in my 1942 book you will find uh, quite a few pages which I devoted to neutral polymorphism, polymorphism that couldn't be due to any selective forces. Well, uh, I've completely uh, <laughs> reneged on that one, and within a very short time, I think within three or four years. The next thing is, uh, let's say, yes, as sympathetic speciation. Now I discovered, well, to, to begin with, when I published my 1942 book, the majority of the taxonomists still believed, as had Darwin, that sympathetic speciation was the major, if not the uh, almost universal form of speciation. And I said, no, it's geographic speciation, following the lead of some continental European authors, and then I took up sympathetic speciation, and if you read my work carefully, which most of my opponents don't do, I don't say sympathetic speciation is impossible, I say no case of sympathetic speciation has been proven, has been well documented, and I myself thought it would be very rare because, and I spell it all out, I said it would mean a simultaneous preference for a, let's say, in mate selection, simultaneous preference for a given set of characters of the mate and the location where the mate is found for two different things. So I said, simultaneous preference for two such very different things is impossible. Well, it's now been shown that it's not only impo uh, impossible, but it occurs very commonly in, in fishes, particularly cichlid fishes. So here's another thing where well, my intuition was wrong. And I'm sure you would, oh yes, well, there are things that well, I've been accused of having been wrong, but I wasn't really wrong in, 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 in that sense. For instance, in 1950, and actually a preliminary publications before that. I showed that the 115 or so species name for fossil hominids and the 32 names for generic names for fossil hominids was ridiculous and that one should make a null position and adopt the smallest possible number of species in general that are uh, can be that are needed to explain the variation among fossil hominids we find. And I cut it down. And I furthermore said 
we have to make the assumption that at any one time only one fossil hominid existed. That was that null thing. And that eliminated about 95 synonyms. Well, pretty soon it was shown that the so-called robust orthopedicines existed side by side with the gracile orthopedicines. Therefore, the idea that there's at any one time only one fossil hominid is wrong. There are two. And uh, that's about the, the only really major mistake I made in that line. On the other hand, I, from the very beginning, I always pointed out that all mammals have geographic races. And for instance, if you take the primates, all, whenever a genus of primates has several species, they're allopathic, with only two exceptions. In the lemurs, you have uh, you have uh, sympathetic species of lemurs, and in Cercopithecus, one of the monkeys. But all the South American <coughs> monkeys, for instance, the different species are all allopathic. And I said, I'm sure that when you had Australopithecus, Africanus, and Afarensis, there must have been a lot of allo species uh, in other parts of Africa where they haven't found any fossils yet. But in some very recent publications, last year only, it was stated that I had always fought for a linear mm -hmm. <laughs> sequence of fossil species, which I never had. I don't think I ever have tackled any scientific problems uh, that ultimately I wasn't able to solve for the simple reason that at the very beginning I already sort of realized well, this is something that's beyond my capacities and I think I've always been realistic enough to tackle things that I could solve. There may be exceptions I don't recall at this moment, but uh, I, th I think in the field of, of, of animal behavior, I've been very much interested in animal behavior at certain times of my life, but I realized that this was a field that uh, uh, would require total attention and I wasn't willing to give it to them, and so I didn't follow up. There are so many things that are challenging to, to figure out one particular thing is most challenging. Well, <clears throat> I've always been thinking that since behavior almost invariably is sort of the pacemaker of anything that happens in evolution, uh, a, a new behavior can be operating with those structures and everything that is already in existence. But then that has to be worked in genetically and all that. And all these connections between how behavior can be modified or how behavior varies without genetic changes into behavior that is different because of genetic changes that whole area, there is still an awful lot to be done. Molecular biology has sort of entered all of biology. Well, the point is that, for instance, you don't have a museum anymore that doesn't have its uh, DNA sequencing machinery and so forth. And I'm beginning to ask, uh, with the molecular methods being used by everybody in all branches of biology, I'm beginning to ask, is there any molecular biology left? Uh, is there something that isn't really part of some other field? But if you go now to an issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy and look at the articles on molecular biology, you find that about a third, if not a quarter, if not a third of them deal with evolutionary problems. And they, the molecular biologists, when they take a certain molecule, 
are interested in, in its evolution. How did it come to be like this in such and such an animal, while it is like that in some other animal, and yet this is basically the same gene or the same molecule, so that now <laughs> the, the lines drawn between the different branches of biology have become, have become very vague in many respects. And uh, at the same time, and let me go back now to the question of natural history. Uh, about two years ago, three years ago, I, for maybe the 20th time, went over the whole business of the species concept. What is a species? And I looked at the major figures in the evolutionary synthesis, and I looked at Dobzhensky and myself and uh, Huxley and Stebbins, all of us had reasonable species concepts and the only person that had a species concept that I thought was quite absurd was the, geo the paleontologist G.G. Simpson. And then I said to myself, well, he can't have been a naturalist uh, in his youth if he had such a peculiar, unworkable species concept. So I went to Simpson's biography, and what did I find? I found that in college, he was an English major. He had never been a naturalist as a youngster. He had never collected anything solar. And he discovered geology in his senior year in college. And from there he went to stratigraphy and finally to paleontology. Not surprisingly, not having been a naturalist, he has no idea what a species is and he never had. I argued with him about the species concept year after year, but lacking that background, uh, he was unable to see it. And that is the thing. Being a naturalist, having had that background of being a naturalist, gives you sort of a view of nature that is, cannot be acquired just learning from books. Mm -hmm. Well, I have spent several years now uh, and corresponding with numerous people on mm -hmm. Ecclesiastics, and I've come to the following conclusion. A. Darwin, in the 13th chapter of The Origin, said, you cannot recognize any taxon, any species or so, or even higher a taxon, without making sure first that all the members are descendants of the nearest common ancestor. Darwin was absolutely, he said, the classification must be genealogical. However, Darwin continued and said this repeatedly, genealogy alone never gives you a good classification. You first have to make groups of similar things and then make sure that they're pure by subjecting them to this cladistic analysis. On the other hand, the second thing the cladists do, so in other words, a uh, cladistic analysis says that they talk so much about his old hat, or even Darwin already said this is what you must do part of the thing. But the second thing is that the cladists say, no, I do not recognize, I do not pay any attention to the of amount of difference or similarity. I go just by the branching points, which means in order to have a class, so-called classification, you take the different branches of a, of a tree and make these into a sort of a classification. And that is a disastrous thing. It leads to nothing but complete nonsense. So when the Cletus talks about avian dinosaurs, well, <laughs> that's just total nonsense. No bird is a dinosaur. No, no dinosaur is a bird but just because they happen to be on the same phyletic lineage. But if you, the minute you do the Darwinian thing and recognize degrees of difference, then of course you have to cut that uh, uh, lineage in various places and make the kind of taxa that are useful and meaningful, and that's what makes a classification. While a cladification, just putting the clades together, is, is a, to, is a to, total, total nonsense, and I think give another 10 or 15 years, I won't be there when it happens. The, this cladistic uh, 
wave that we are having at the present time will have completely died down and, and been forgotten. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I have too many projects going, but two of them fortunately are already in the editor's hands. One is this, bio, this book on the birds of northern Melanesia I'm doing with Jared Diamond, and that deals with speciation in particular, ecology, biogeography, dispersal, and all the other questions. In the greatest detail, we have material for each one of the 194 species, and I think it will be considered a classic when it is published. The second book is an evolution book. We have some extremely good books, three of them, great big books, 700 pages on evolution by Futuma, by uh, Ridley, and by Strickberger. And if a beginner wants to have a book on evolution, well, you can't give him th those kind of books. And we have otherwise a whole series of good books refuting the claims of the creationists. But we don't have a mid-level book that is a good introduction into evolutionary biology without going into the utmost detail. And that's the kind of book I've written. And it is, as I said, already in the editor's hands and will come out sometime this year. Now, I'm working also on a book that I'm surprised nobody else has written before. If you ask anybody which book has, at the present time, the greatest impact and had the greatest impact on the thinking of Western man, of course the Bible is in first place, and then the next thing, what next? Well, for a while, of course, it was Karl Marx with Das Kapital, but ever since the bankruptcy of Marxism was declared in 89, I think you would never place that right after the Bible, and then the only other book that is really in the running there is Darwin's Origin of Species. And so what I'm doing is an extremely detailed analysis of the first edition of Darwin's Origin of Species, 1859. I really look at every sentence and compare it with what he said before and afterwards and why he said that and so on and so forth. I have one... I, that, the book consists of two parts. I have a first draft of the first part. I still have to do the second part and revise the whole thing. It will take me another two years before it's finished. Finally, I um, have a manuscript of about 70 pages from, on the basic principles, the theory of ordering material usually referred to as classification, but I discovered that classification is only one of many systems of ordering, for instance, uh, listing books alphabetically in a telephone directory is a system of ordering, but it is not a classification. And this is very important because right now in the field of taxonomy, we have a great controversy going between people who order in the traditional manner by recognizing classes of similar entities and enlarge them in a hierarchical system, or which divide up the genetic tree into branches and sorting these branches. And these are two very different systems, although the representatives of the branching approach do not realize how different they are and I have a manuscript that is uh, in the next to last uh, draft and might probably not be finished, not be published this year, but certainly be finished this year. That's the work I've been doing lately. <laughs>